Last thing, we pray that God, the Holy Spirit, will open our hearts to the truth, for we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Philemon was a wealthy Christian who lived in Colossae. He was a prominent member of the church at Colossae. Apparently, at this time, he was an owner of some slaves, as apparently all wealthy people in the Roman Empire were. He had a slave by the name of Onesimus. Onesimus ran away from his master. Why? We do not know. All we know is that Onesimus, in fleeing from Colossae, found his way to Rome. Apparently, he stole some money from his master when he left. He went to Rome, and there he spent the money and found himself in dire circumstances and remembered the name of a man residing in Rome under guard that his master had mentioned many times, one by the name of Paul. Somehow, in that great city, he came into contact with Paul, and through the contact, Onesimus accepted Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. Now Onesimus has trusted in Christ, and he begins to serve the Lord in the city of Rome. When Paul wrote the letter to the Colossians, at the same time that he wrote this letter, he also wrote the short note that we have known as Philemon. He wrote a letter to the entire church at Colossae. He wrote a personal note to Philemon, one of the members of the Colossian church. Onesimus was to carry these letters from Rome and from Paul to Colossae, and a crisis is precipitated by the return of Onesimus to Colossae and to the Lycus Valley. You see, Onesimus departed from Colossae a stealing slave. He comes back as a saved servant. So this very important book of Philemon, and you'll see as we go through, we can't even handle it in one Sunday school hour. We aren't going to do too much justice to it in two Sunday school hours, but that's about how long it will take us. You see, when Onesimus returns, what will be Philemon's attitude toward Onesimus? Is he going to punish him as a runaway slave, or is he going to receive him as a Christian brother, as a fellow believer in Jesus Christ. The repercussions of this particular book are tremendous from the standpoint of the doctrine of grace, from the standpoint of modus operandi in the life of any believer, from the standpoint of the social structure of the Roman Empire, which at this time was slavery, slavery which is not condoned. God never condones slavery. God never condones one group of people enslaving another group of people so that that group do not have the right of the first divine institution, which is volition. Slavery is contradictory to divine institution number one. And there never has been an empire, there has never been a group of people who have survived in the practice of slavery. And there has never been a national entity, and there has never been an empire which has not had repercussion as a result of the practice of slavery. Now, as far as the history of these United States is concerned, my great-great-grandfather was a practicer of slavery. And he had many slaves, and I am now paying the piper for what he did. What he did cannot be biblically condoned, no matter how you slice it, any more than you would condone the idea of being the slaves of the communists. It wasn't right, it was wrong. I'm paying the piper for it. Now, the fact that these United States have survived the practice of slavery indicates that a change was made in our history, which change came after the war between the states. 
Slavery is not condoned. No matter how well the slaves are treated or how bad, that isn't the issue. The issue is that the principle of slavery is wrong, here or anywhere else in the world. And the reason that we survived is because of the outcome of the war between the states and because of the liberation of slaves. But in our survival as a country, we are also paying the piper for the reaction to our survival created a problem which cannot be solved in 100 years or 200 years and maybe not in 300 years. Suddenly, liberated within a national entity which was not destroyed, as was the case with the Roman Empire, which practiced slavery, suddenly liberated are a group of people who are different from the others who colonize this area in every possible way. And a social problem is created which can only be solved in one or two ways. The problem can resolve itself by removing the slaves in total and placing them back in their former homeland, as was the case in the Babylonian captivity when the Persian Empire sent Israel back to its own land. However, this solution was not utilized, except in the creation of a very small nation in Africa known as Liberia. Nor could it be utilized, because the problem had existed for too long, and too many generations multiplied the Negro race in this country. So what was the solution? Well, the Constitution offered a solution which says that all citizens of this country, regardless of the color of skin, regardless of national background, regardless of any other factor, have, should have the same opportunities. Now, When it says they should have the same opportunities, it means they should have the same educational rights, the same cultural rights. We recognize from the standpoint of Christianity that anyone in this country, any member of the human race, regardless of any other factor, has a right to hear the gospel, to receive Christ, to be born again, and so on. And to some extent, this was practiced in isolated areas of this country. But because of the practice of over 100 years of slavery in this country, there are certain repercussions which simply follow divine laws of discipline. The problem has not been solved. The problem cannot be solved by any means, any human expediency. And when attempts are made to solve such a problem, often they result in the rising of other evils. So that today we face on both sides of the, of the fence of the Negro situation very, very serious wrong. And no one has come up with a sane, logical solution as yet. And I suspect no one will for some time because there is too much prejudice, too much stupidity, too much attempt to solve this without going through what is known in England as constitutional means. Now at the same time we are facing a system of integration which no one can avoid. If the Lord tarries if the millennium does not occur for some time as yet, whether you know it or not, at the present population increase, there will be a solution by natural birth. This will be, in several hundreds of years, a Negro nation by sheer multiplication. You just look up the tables for yourself and figure it out. 
Now, obviously, I have not committed myself to one solution or another. As one who is a teacher of the Word of God, slavery is prohibited. There are certain applications to the situation which can be made from the spiritual standpoint, but there is certainly and obviously at the present time one thing that is true. In very few parts of these United States is there any correct solution to the problem. And while the South is highly criticized for its prejudice against these people, the North, in a much more subtle and a much more, uh, sometimes more hypocritical way, have been just as prejudiced, if not more so. The problem has not been solved in any part of the country. The closest solution to the problem that I personally ever saw was in the state of California during my boyhood days when no one thought anything about it, one way or another, and where there was never, ever, as far as I know, ever a problem. But in that same state of California today, there is a type of integration which is practiced, which is most interesting, in the area of the labor unions, and I have investigated to some extent and found out that the greatest prejudice against this particular race is found in the labor unions in areas such as California, Michigan, and so on. There isn't any solution right now, whether you know it or not. And everyone has a lot of prejudice which is passed down from generation to generation, and as long as prejudice is applied to the situation rather than the Word of God, there is no solution. Now Philemon faced the same problem that we are facing today. He faced the problem of slavery. Philemon himself was a believer who had slaves. He was a Christian. He was born again, and he was practicing slavery in the Roman Empire, which had come to be acceptable everywhere, and it was never considered to be immoral or unethical to have slaves. Even though from the biblical standpoint, slavery has never been condoned, here is a man who is going to be faced with a problem because Philemon is a very fine spiritual man. So when you study the letter to Philemon, I want you to understand it has personal repercussions as far as your life is concerned. It has personal repercussions as far as operation that grace is concerned, and I think you'll find some rather interesting clues as to what is the solution to any social problem that has ever existed, regardless of what it is. Now, there are many social problems which we face today. The worst social problem that we face today is really an economic problem. That is, the average American does not have the right to work. He doesn't have the right to use his volition under the divine institution and to find a job. He must pay a middleman called a labor union for the right to work in many areas. And once he becomes a part of this labor union, he no longer can make decisions of his own. He becomes subject to a hierarchy which in the operation of its dictatorship and its methods have certainly equaled other great dictatorships and forms of slavery in the past. This is a social problem and an economic problem which is being ignored primarily by the federal government. And in substitution thereof, a tremendous amount of time is being spent through various means in trying to solve the problem created by the folly of my great-grandparents and some of yours. The, the violation of a biblical precept, namely slavery. All right, in verses 1 through 4, we have the introduction to this letter. Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Now, he says, not a prisoner of Nero. He, this is during his first imprisonment. And at the time he wrote Philemon, he was no longer confined in jail as such. Paul was in under the custody of the Praetorian Guard and had a great deal of freedom. But he doesn't call himself the prisoner of Caesar, the prisoner of Nero. He calls himself the prisoner of Jesus Christ. In so doing, he recognizes that there are no accidents in the Christian life. 
he recognizes that all things work together for good. So he calls himself not the prisoner of Caesar, but the prisoner of Christ. He is therefore looking at life from the divine viewpoint. He is practicing the technique of occupation with the person of Jesus Christ, and he will become the basis of helping others in a similar situation, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. To whom is this addressed? You will notice, unto Philemon, our dearly beloved and fellow laborer, and to our beloved Apphia and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in thy house. There is a fourfold address, one to Philemon. Philemon is Paul's convert. We know this from verse 19, where it says, I, Paul, have written it with my own hand. I will repay it, albeit I do not say to thee, how thou owest unto me, even thine own self decide. Philemon was a man who had been led to the Lord Jesus Christ by the ministry of Paul. He is a wealthy Christian now residing at Colossae. Apphia is his wife. Archippus is his son and apparently the pastor of the Laodicean church. We conclude this from Colossians chapter 4, verse 17. Notice it speaks well for Philemon that as a wealthy and successful man, he did not discourage his son from becoming a preacher. Did you get that point? Some of you are still so dazed that you haven't really gotten with us yet. I have said not once, but three times, Philemon was a wealthy man. But one thing we can say immediately in the favor of Philemon, there will be others in just a moment, even though he was wealthy, he did not discourage his son from becoming a preacher. Parents have tremendous responsibility to their children, educating them and so on. And uh, parents also have a responsibility of presenting those spiritual principles of doctrine which will lead to the conversion of their children and those spiritual principles which will lead to their children operating in a way that is pleasing to the Lord. And parents must recognize that while they must superimpose their own judgment upon their children all during their minority, that when the child reaches a certain stage, when it comes to selecting what he is to do for life, the child must make up his own mind. If I had followed my father's desires and wishes in the matter, I would be an engineer. So I'm not an engineer. And I thank God that I'm not an engineer. Not that we don't need engineers, but God called me to something else. Now, my father didn't approve of it, and still doesn't. And my father bucked me at every point. And my father is still putting pressure on me to get out of the ministry. So I understand this principle. Parents have certain definite rights as parents, but when the child, when it comes time for the child to choose his occupation for life, with the exception, of course, of those things which are lawless. He chooses something like becoming a bank robber or something of that sort. Obviously, the parents have obligations. But parents have no right to try to coerce children into their own molds because while your children are like you in many ways, they are not like you in other ways, for which we all thank God. And it is true that some children emulate their parents. It is also true that some children do not. And thank God that we live in a country not like India where every child is free to choose upon maturity his own occupation or profession in life. That's a part of the American way of life. If you lived in India and your father was a sweet sweeper, you'd be a, a, a street sweeper. My, it's delightful to know that so many are listening this morning. Wherever you have a predominance of religion, you have a predominance of some sort of caste system. And you have slavery as a result of religion. 
and, re- and India has all of the Oriental religions, and as a result, the people are starving to death with enough T-bones to feed the next three generations. And people have no choice as to their lifetime occupation. And India is one of the sorriest nations on the face of the earth, and it is one of the most heavily religious nations. The two heaviest religious nations in the world today, communist Russia and India, and both are very sorry places to live. All right. Here is Philemon, and his son Archippus is in the ministry, and he didn't buck him on it. And you will also notice this is addressed to the church, which met in the home of Philemon. And this is a reminder of a principle that the, and of course this will delight you in your present status, until for the first 300 years, all churches met in private homes or in catacombs, or caves, or out in the open air, or somewhere, but there were no church buildings until the third century. And while I will not drive home this point, there were no church buildings until there was a union between church and state. Acts 12.12, 12, 1 Corinthians 16.19, Romans 16.5, Colossians 4.15, churches met in homes. All right, the basis of Christian operation, verses 3 and 4. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace is the subject of this epistle. Grace is the issue of this epistle. We'll see that in a moment. I thank my God, making mention of thee always in my prayers, Grace, peace, and prayer. This is the basis of Christian operation. Verse 5. The testimony of Philemon starts in verse 5 and goes through verse 7. I want you to notice it very carefully. Verse 5 says, Hearing of thy love and faith which thou hast toward the Lord Jesus and toward all saints. Please notice the logical order. He has love and faith toward Jesus Christ which results in love and faith toward believers. One does not precede the other. You can have no brotherhood, no true relationship with other members of the human race until you have true relationship with God. You must be born again before you can have the proper perspective and relationship with other members of the fellow of the human race. Now, attitude toward Jesus Christ, then, reflects itself in attitude toward others. And we can readily understand what is meant by love toward all believers. But, would you please notice something very strange here? He says, faith toward believers. And this phrase demands some explanation. What does he mean, faith toward believers? We understand love toward believers. We understand that the basic principle of the Christian way of life, experientially, is to love all the brethren. We understand that this can only be fulfilled by the indwelling and filling of the Holy Spirit. But what about faith in believers? We understand faith in Jesus Christ. But this, the syntax of this verse includes faith toward other believers. And what does that mean? It amounts to believing what believers say regardless of their motivation in the matter. If believers have lied to you, God will thank them for that. But it implies a number of things. First of all, in all relationship between believers, there must be honesty. There must be truth. And I mean social relationship, business relationship, and all the rest of it. One of the greatest areas of criticism for so-called Christianity today, which in most cases is not, is cheating in business among believers and on the part of Christian men. And there is nothing that hurts the testimony of a Christian man or even a woman in business faster than any kind of dishonest practice, uh, either verbally or in modus operandi, among believers. I believe that God still permits Christians to get ahead financially without any false or crooked business practice. And that's the implication. Faith toward believers. It goes all the way out. You can apply it on. Now, I want you to get to verse 6. 
And the first point I make about verse 6, it, it is not correctly translated. And I want you to get the correct translation down. I will read it as it is, first of all, in the King James Version. That the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. Now, the word communication means fellowship or sharing. And I will, first of all, give you a correct translation of this verse. That the sharing of your faith. Philemon is sharing his faith with other believers. That the sharing of your faith might become power or energy in the full knowledge of all that goes, all the good that is ours in Christ. Again, that the sharing of your faith might become power or energy in full power of all the good that is ours in Christ. What does this mean? By fellowship with other believers, Philemon communicates his faith, he shares it with other believers, so that they become strong or powerful. This communication of faith results in power, which in turn results in a full knowledge of the good things that we have in Christ. Now, as you begin to see from verse 6, Philemon has a tremendous testimony. Philemon is a spiritual giant. He's a great man. We have seen in verse 5 that he has love and faith toward Christ. He has love and faith toward believers. And he also is sharing or communicating his faith to other believers so that they become powerful and they come to a knowledge, a full experiential knowledge of the truth. Now, verse 7, Paul rejoices and is consoled by the tremendous advance of one of his spiritual children. This is all leading up to a point, by the way. For Paul says, we have only, it says literally, I have great joy and consolation in thy love because of the innermost being of the saints are refreshed, perfect tense, refreshed in the past with results that continue forever by thee, brother. Now, what does this verse actually mean? It means that wherever Philemon goes, with whomever he has fellowship, the inner life of those believers are refreshed in a permanent way. They are refreshed in the past, contact with him, with the result that they continue to be refreshed. The word bowels means innermost being, or heart. It refers to the inner life of the believer. And we see now one of the great things in Philemon. He has the ability to stimulate the inner man of others from fellowship and contact with them. And so the pattern of verse 6 becomes very important. You see, the, the pattern of verse 6 is carried over now into verse 7. The basis of such fellowship, by the way, is the Word of God. Fellowship in which faith is communicated is based upon a knowledge and understanding and dissemination of the Word of God on an individual as well as collective basis. And such faith, is, as which is mentioned as being toward Christ and toward the brethren, is developed by the Word. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. And this faith communicated produces power in other believers, and the power results in the refreshing of the inner life of other believers and their knowledge of divine things or doctrine. Now, this is the pattern of stimulation of other believers and this is the first lesson in Philemon. And you will notice that behind this is the basic principle that such stimulation of other believers is not possible apart from the Word of God. What does this mean by application to you? No matter how scintillating your personality, no matter how much you are the life of every party, this does not refresh other believers. Refreshment of other believers comes by something that everyone can have, and therefore you no longer have to be the wallflower. You no longer have to have an inferiority complex. It is an understanding and application and living the Word of God that provides refreshment on a permanent basis for others. Now, there are always some in every group, in every congregation. A congregation of our size must have a large number of social lions. These are the people who are always invited because they are the life of the party. And so people be spend so much time trying to be the life of the party that they fail to become a, base, a, 
a, a basis of blessing to others. Now, Philemon is, not, is never said to be a social lion. Philemon was not a comic. Philemon didn't make everyone laugh. Philemon knew the word of God and he passed it on. And therefore, Philemon became a permanently refreshing person to others. And why spend time developing your personality and how to win friends and influence people when all you need is the doctrine of the word of God, living it out and passing it on verbally and becoming a source of refreshment to others? You see, that's the point. Now, the life of every believer must be anchored in the Word for this to be true. Not in personality, not in attractiveness from the human standpoint. So the secret of Philemon's influence was not Philemon's personality, not his good looks, not his scintillation, and uh, not any human attractiveness. Refresh is a very important word. As I've already said, it's in the perfect tense. We can only refresh the lives of other believers by drawing them into the Word and by disseminating information with regard to the Word of God. And by this, of course, the complete understanding of doctrines, techniques, and principles. Now, you see, in effect, I as a pastor need a lot of help from the congregation. You rub elbows with people every day who do not understand what is the faith rest technique. Perhaps they have come in recently into the congregation and they have only heard the term, but they still don't know what it means. And so in a personal conversation with you, they are inquisitive. You have the opportunity of passing on the, inform the faith rest technique. You have the opportunity of passing on information with regard to rebound, and this becomes a basis of permanent refreshment to them. Rebound, the faith rest technique, how to be filled with the Spirit, occupation with Christ, and these other things, you see. There are a lot of people that do not understand these things. They've only heard the terms. I can't stop and explain the faith rest life every time I'm... I mention it. I can't stop and explain rebound every time I mention it. Well, I'd never get anywhere. But this is your responsibility to pass these things on and become a source of refreshment to others. So behind Philemon is the impact of grace. This love and faith of Philemon, which is reaching into the lives of others, is now at the point of great danger, and Philemon is facing the greatest crisis of his life. What is this crisis? the return of his runaway slave, voluntarily the messenger and deliverer of the epistle to the Colossians and this personal letter to Philemon. So Philemon is about to face the great crisis of his life, which will either make or break him as far as his influence in the lives of others is concerned. Now here's the issue. If Philemon's attitude toward his slave Onesimus is colored with any legalism, it will end his great spiritual influence in the Lycus Valley. Hence the importance of this letter, for this letter warns Philemon and rewards us to remove ourselves from anything which will ruin our testimony, and this often has to do with Operation Legalism. So the crisis point of Philemon is now the return of the slave. What's going to be his attitude? If he receives Philemon, if Philemon receives Onesimus as a Christian saved by grace, forgives and forgets immediately, restores him and frees him. If he restores him, forgives him, frees him, he will emerge as one of the great spiritual giants of all time. He'll be criticized for it even by other Christians. But if, on the other hand, Philemon uses legalism, if he punishes in any way, if he now censors Onesimus, he will pull the rug of grace out from under himself. He will destroy his own operation of grace, the thing that has made him, and the purpose of this letter is to cause Philemon to face the issue from the standpoint of grace. Now, what about Onesimus? Onesimus was wrong. The fact that Philemon was wrong in having slaves does not excuse Onesimus for running away. For in both the fourth chapter of Colossians as well as the third, and in the fifth and sixth chapters of Ephesians, and in many other passages of Scripture, the problem of Christian slavery is dealt with as far as the Roman Empire is concerned with many applications to present life. The slaves were told when they became Christians not to run away. They were told to stay around and give a testimony to their masters 
whether the master was a good one or a bad one. They were still to live the life and to testify as they had opportunity. They were not to run away. They were to depend entirely upon the Lord. And this is covered not once, but at least in three different passages of Scripture. Now, what is Philemon as a master? What is his attitude going to be? You see, Onesimus ran away, and that was wrong. And when Onesimus ran away, apparently he stole some money from Philemon. That was wrong. And two wrongs do not make a right. The fact that Philemon was wrong in having slaves does not justify Onesimus in running away and in stealing. But after he committed these wrongs, plus all of the other sins of his life, he found Christ as Savior through the ministry of Paul in Rome. And the moment that he believed in Christ, his past was blotted out forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth to those things which are before. I, even I, am he that blotteth out thy transgressions for mine own sake and will not remember thy sins. I have blotted out as a thick cloud thy sins and as a cloud thy transgressions. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. And not only is it true of Philemon, but it is true of every Christian None of us have the right to penalize people for their pre-salvation failures. When a person believes in Christ as Savior, his past is blotted out. He is born again. He is a new creature in Christ. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses from some sin. Is that what it says? All sin. And just as your sins were blotted out the day you received Christ, so it is with Onesimus. His sins are blotted out. And there's a great issue here because Philemon, this great wealthy Christian of Colossae in the Lycus Valley, and uh, apparently he's the most prominent individual of all three churches in the Lycus Valley. And at this point, there's a great issue involved, and I want you to hear the issue again. If you have anything to say, say it after I'm through. Philemon can lose that gigantic testimony of refreshment of other believers by penalizing, by ostracizing, by making trouble for the man who voluntarily comes back born again. And if Philemon does not forgive as Christ forgave him, not only is his testimony ruined, but the testimony of the churches in the Lycus Valley will be set back definitely and perhaps permanently. So this is a very important point. It's a very serious moment. And this letter is not simply written to Philemon. This letter is written to you and to me as Christians, warning us of the issues of the life of grace. The purpose of the letter, verses 8 through 12. Verse 8. Wherefore, though I might be much bold in Christ to command thee, the word enjoin means to command, I might be bold in Christ to command thee that which is convenient or befitting. Two words need clarification. Enjoin means to command. Convenient means befitting or fitting. Now, Paul is an apostle. He has the gift of spiritual dictatorship. And he can actually, before the completion of the canon of Scripture, he can dictate to Philemon what Philemon ought to do. He can say, Philemon, when this slave comes back, remember he's born again, don't you dare criticize him. Don't you dare censor him. You forgive him and free him and forget it. If he commands him to do it, the issue of grace is lost. The whole point is lost. Philemon must face the crisis without any commands. If he is commanded, then the issue is lost. The pressure of legalism and coercion must be faced 
without any command from higher authority. Paul must not overprotect his spiritual child by Lehman. If Paul orders him to do it, he will do it, but the issue of grace is lost. He's doing it because he's told to do it. You see that? He, if, if Paul says, as an apostle of Jesus Christ, Philemon, I command thee to receive, to forgive, to forget, and to free Onesimus. Now he does it because he's commanded to. There is no issue. Grace is not the issue. And therefore, Paul is now stating that he is not going to command him to do it, that the issue of grace must stand, and that Philemon must make his own decision whether he's going to operate on the basis of grace or whether he's going to operate on the basis of legalism. Wherefore, Paul says, I might be very bold in Christ to command thee. I might order you to do this, that which is befitting. Yet for love's sake, I rather beseech thee, being such a one as Paul, please notice he doesn't use the word apostle, that's his rank. He doesn't say Paul, the five-star general. He says Paul, the aged, which is not aged, but Paul, the ambassador. In other words, Paul is putting himself on the same level with Philemon. They are both ambassadors for Christ. Instead of mentioning his rank, he goes back to their position in Christ. And he says Paul, the ambassador, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. So he doesn't pull his rank. He doesn't order him to do this. The appeal is not based on a command, but is based on love. If Paul had said, do this, then the issue is lost and grace is no longer the issue. But Philemon must face this crisis point on the basis of grace, just as you, Christian, must face many of these things in your life on the basis of Operation Grace. You have the right to choose between grace and legalism in your dealing with others. And often, the whole testimony of a local church is based upon what people know about one individual and your attitude toward other believers and your attitude toward even unbelievers is determined, determines often what people think of any local church with which you are connected in any way. You don't even have to be in the membership role. All you have to do is to be connected by attendance or any way, and people do not know other individuals in the church, but they know you. And modus operandi grace gives that church a testimony, and more, much more important, the Lord Jesus Christ, an entree into their lives. But where there is modus operandi legalism, then the refreshment is destroyed, and there is no blessing or testimony or witness. Now, we'll stop at this point and continue next time and see how this subject is approached. Father, we're grateful for the opportunity of studying these things. Open our hearts to them, for we ask it in Christ's name. Amen.